when it comes to actually planting those trees in the ground, you also kind of break some of the more classical rules of, of planting trees, right? At least when you consider it compared to commercial orchards. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, we're not looking at lining out our, our, our personal residential property like a commercial orchard. You know, I, I don't want to do that. I don't recommend that to anybody. You want to incorporate your landscape theme and your, you know, uh, landscape needs into the trees that you're going to plant out into your garden. So you want to make sure that you're looking for all those other functions, you know, uh, flower color, fragrance, uh, fall colors, you know, function of the, of the tree itself and how you place the tree and how you use the tree for something other than just fruit production. So the, I probably the most important uh, two considerations would be how's your drainage? How does your soil drain? Um, so you, you want to do some percolation tests. You want to dig some holes around your property. You want to fill those with water. You want to come back and check and see how long did it take to drain. If it drains out 15, 20 minutes, half an hour, great, perfect. If it takes an hour, hour and a half, two hours, fair good good not bad good if it takes if there's still water in the hole uh in the next morning then you know you've got poor drainage so those are areas where you need to make sure you're putting the right varieties into the right location so that they can take advantage of that you know we have rootstocks that'll take heavy wet soil so you would you choose citation rootstock for your plum if you had poor drainage you'd also plan on a rise a little bit of a mound so you get that root ball up above your native grade so that it can oxygenate a little bit and doesn't uh, stagnate and become anaerobic from that water not being able to get away from the root ball. If you want a good quality sweet fruit, I want a sweet peach, I want a sweet navel orange, I want sweet mandarins, you know, those, those are going to pick up the ability to convert acids over to sugars by uh, a lot of warmth and a lot of light exposure. So choose the sunniest areas on your property for fruit trees. If you're planting something that doesn't necessarily need to be sweet, a lemon, a lime, uh, blueberries are a good candidate. They'll be sweet still, but you can put those in a little bit of shade. If I want to plant those varieties in an area that gets a little bit of morning shade or a little bit of afternoon shade, I can do that. Two or three hours of shade in the morning, two or three hours of shade in the afternoon is, is going to take the, the harshest summer physical stress off the tree and it's still going to give you a decent piece of fruit, but I'm putting a variety in there like a bare seedless lime where I'm not really looking at developing sugars. I'm looking at growing a, a fruit for a nice tart lime acidic flavor, tart yeah. ability. Yeah, we actually just made, um, I made some ice cream with the bear's lime yesterday. Oh, wonderful. Uh, yeah, like a little lime ice cream, which I'd never tried before. And it was the tartness I was looking for. Yeah. Uh, and so even though I think we harvested them full ripe so they they turn that sort of yellow green yeah. color yeah. which takes a little bit of that acidity out i think but regardless it was still quite good so sun exposure and drainage and i'll speak to drainage in a second but i, I do want to touch on the spacing because to me that was the scariest part when i was putting in the citrus hedge you know going four feet apart knowing that even on dwarf or semi-dwarf rootstock they still are going to want to get much larger than that they'll crash into each other so to speak sure and getting i guess a little bit afraid of how that might play out, are the roots going to compete with one another? Maybe we could touch on that because I think that's perhaps the most nerve-wracking part of, of the backyard orchard cultures is so-called cramming these trees together. Right, right. Well, first of all, I looked at your citrus hedge and I love it. You did a fantastic job. I use that exact model in workshops and, and lectures that I do all the time. You know, what if I just wanted to plant a hedge? I wanted a, something that's going to be eight feet tall and two or three or four feet wide, and I want it to be 40 feet long. You know, I could go get any one of a number of common ornamental hedging plants and accomplish that in no time at all. But now if I choose citrus, I've got a plant that's every bit as, as uh, adaptable as far as a hedge goes. I can sculpt it. I can prune it. I can grow it to three feet wide. I can grow it to eight feet tall. I can plant them four feet apart and let them integrate together. And now where I only wanted a screen, now I've got fragrant flowers in the springtime. I've got this beautiful sculptable green structure and I've got 10 varieties of fruit. That's one of the things that backyard orchard culture is all about. Yeah, I, and for me, I put it on the north side of my front yard, which is the most sort of suburban looking area with the idea that, to your point about manageable height, getting it to maybe seven, eight feet or so, no, no real more than that, and effectively blocking out the street view as I look 
in the front side of my garden. So it feels like I'm more contained than I really am because we're just in a suburban, you know, area here. Uh, and then being on that north side, obviously getting all that southern sun throughout the course of the day has really brought the sweetness out of, let's say, those satsumas that I've been growing. Yeah, and absolutely. So it, it's really played out almost exactly as I thought, which was really cool to see. Uh, and then I wanted to touch on avocados just for a second to, to highlight the two-in-one or three-in-one or four-in-one whole method that you talk about a lot. Mm -hmm. So what we did is we planted the avocados kind of up on a mound because we realized after killing a few that I, we think it was a drainage issue. They just seemed to not want to take as much clay as we might have here. So we planted them kind of up on a mound, uh, put some burlap over, and, and they've taken, and we've also planted two. So we did a, a Haas and a Fuerte uh, and put them, I don't know, two feet apart with this idea of kind of pruning out the interior and letting them grow as one big bush, which is just so close together. It just feels a bit foreign, I guess, for someone who's used to more tr traditional planting techniques, I guess. So from a commercial grower's perspective, they'd never do that. You know, you're gonna individually space trees so that they have plenty of room. From a backyard grower's perspective, it makes perfect sense. So now you've got a Hass and a Fuerte together. You've got type A and type B flowers, so you're gonna get great overlapping, uh, wonderful pollination between the two. You're gonna get a, a winter spring fruit from your Fuerte. You're gonna get a spring summer fruit from your Hass. So you've got now seven, eight, maybe nine months worth of successive ripening avocados growing in the space where you would have just had one tree before. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna structure that plant as it grows up and matures, it's gonna look like a double trunk tree. Yeah. You're not gonna have you know, two individual canopies, you're gonna allow those to intermingle a little bit and have just one nice big double structure. So that it's gonna work out perfect. And if you were to throw a bacon or a Stewart or a, a Zutano in there, as a, as a third specimen, now you've got that fall season covered and you've got successive ripening avocados 12 months out of the year. That's the dream. I may actually have to retroactively add a third to get that year round avocado. So the, the question I would have and may, maybe many listening is, would, would the roots not compete? When you think about an annual veggie garden, there is a level of spacing you sort of have to respect, especially because you're usually planting different species together. And so if I'm cramming three avocados in a hole, won't all three of those roots want to fight for the same nutrients or no? That's a great question. And, and what we've found over the years is as long as you're growing varieties that are compatible varieties, like all avocados are grafted onto an avocado rootstock, all citrus are gonna be grafted onto a fairly compatible citrus rootstock, all peaches are gonna be grown on the same similar type of rootstock. So what those plants do when they're planted in close spacing like that is within two, three or four years, the root systems actually pleach together and grow together underground. So what you achieve from three or four individually planted specimens, you're gonna get one mature growing specimen that's, that's all one living unit. So the roots sort of complement one another in a way. The roots sort of complement each other, will grow together. And so then what you wanna to do to manage that combination is you wanna always manage your more vigorous varieties. Okay. So if I get one uh, peach that grows out six feet one year and another that only grows out two feet, I'm gonna manage that six foot tree and bring it back down into perspective with the weaker variety sure. so that I'm never letting any one variety dominate the combination. Once, if I have a three in one, all three varieties get exactly one third of that combo. If I have a four in one, all four varieties get exactly 25% of that combination. You don't want anyone to dominate or you'll start to lose the weaker varieties. Right, then you're sort of negating the, the whole reason you did it in the first exactly. place. Watch the full episode right here and subscribe for more new episodes every single week.